So today I want to split my talk into two parts, um, really talking about how we've been really focused in, um, in really trying to understand the biological basis for epilepsy because uh, although we do have good treatments and options surgically and uh, medicines for people with epilepsy is a variety of them, but uh, still there remains to be a large number of patients who uh, are not responsive to the current available anti-seizure drugs and are not uh, um, uh, sur where surgery is not really an option. So there's clearly a need to uh, to understand the biological basis of this. And all of this work actually started when I was a postdoc here in San Diego at the Salk Institute, where we focused on looking at adult newborn neurons. So I'm going to talk about that. And then more recently, really inspired, I think, by a lot of the efforts here uh, at the Sanford Consortium to use human IPS models and organoids. Okay, so I've already kind of alluded to this, how epilepsy is still a very, um, it's a large problem both here in the U.S. and also globally. And part of the reason why we don't really have, there's this urgent need um, to treat epilepsy is that uh, the, a large majority of patients are children. They, uh, they either have an unknown cause or there is a developmental cause. And, um, and then there's a lot of side effects for these drugs. So we, we, uh, we really want to make a difference here. Okay, so then there's been a lot of work look, trying to model various epilepsies. So the first part of the, my talk, I want to focus on acquired epilepsy. So these are epilepsies where one might get from maybe uh, after a, a severe traumatic brain injury. This is work that is done by Caroline Hauser quite a number of years ago where she looked at patients with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. It's one of these, these acquired epilepsies. And what she noticed is that in the granule cell layer of the, of the hippocampus, that patients with uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, those granule cells are, are dispersed. And you can see this from the arrowheads compared to a control patient where you have that nicely, densely packed region. So these dentate granule cells, the abnormals, have been noticed for quite a number of years. And, and scientists have modeled acquired uh, temporal lobe epilepsy using um, excited toxic um, compounds like canic acid or pilocarpine. And for example, in rats tr or even mice treated with these compounds, and they have a, a very severe epilepsy status epilepticus. Acutely after these seizures, uh, people notice that these same granule cells also show these prominent abnormalities. For example, there's dispersion of the granule cells. There's also basal dendrites. Normally, these granule cells have the beautiful, you know, projected apical dendrites, but these cells will have basal dendrites. And also, they're frequently found in ectopic location. They sort of leave this granule cell layer, and you can see them in the hilus or even the molecular layer. So the question is, are these adult-born? So again, many people have looked at this, including our lab, and using retroviruses that will infect dividing progenitor cells and then looking at those labeled cells over time after pilocarpine or canic acid, it turns out that yes, the, these adult uh, newborn neurons are also showing these prominent abnormal features in these epilepsy models. For example, these basal dendrites as shown here, they're also ectopic in the hilus or the molecular layer, and they even undergo this like a dense sprouting, these mossy fibers. So taking all of this together, we, uh, we sort of came up with this idea that although adult hippocampal neurogenesis has these n notable beneficial roles that normally, but that after a severe brain injury, which d during this, this latent period where a number of events happen, including these ectopic granule cells, these aberrant sprouting, even increased proliferation, with followed by eventual depletion of the neural stem cell pool, and uh, other cellular changes, gliosis and loss of inhibitory interneurons, all together suggests that there is this dark side of adult hippocampal neurogenesis, that these cells may actually contribute to these 
uh, spontaneous recurrent seizures and cognitive deficits that is frequently observed both in um, patients and also in these rodent models. And, and work that we've done, uh, again, starting from the time I was a postdoc and almost in the last 20 years, we've been like systematically chipping away at this question. So first we use genetic tools to ablate because we wanted to see the cause and effect relationship of these newborn cells and these, these the, and epileptogenesis, right? These spontaneous recurrent seizures. So we used a, a first uh, an ablation model where we could genetically remove the cells and we show that these cells do contribute to these spontaneous recurrent seizures. Now, of course, of course, once you remove the cells, it's very difficult to study what happened, right? And maybe what, in fact, what we were studying is a compensatory, you know, reaction to removing the cells. And so again, kind of going back to that central hypothesis, we, we, we hypothesize that these aberrant adult-born granule cells contribute to seizures, but we also know that not all adult neurogenesis is bad, right? So normally, these adult neuro neurogenesis does not lead to seizures. So it's still, we have to keep asking this question, what is mechanistically different that drives these aberrant adult-born granule cells, and, and we don't want to remove the cells so that we can try to study this. So then this is, this is work that um, we recently published, so I'm really going to just summarize to get to some of the newer directions and findings. So again, a few years ago, we speculated and hypothesized that maybe it's aberrant activity in these earliest stages of the adult-born granule cells that promote aberrant maturation. So we know that these newborn neurons are responsive to GABA early in their development and that this promotes maturation. So maybe we thought also during epileptogenesis there is this aberrant activity. So to model this, Zane Librand, when he was still a postdoc in my lab, he now has his own lab up in Dallas at Texas Women's University. City. What Zane decided to do was to use uh, chemogenetics, so he used dreads. He, he uh, expressed the HM3DQ in a retrovirus, and the, the, these um, constructs have GFP, so he could look at the GFP expression and, and see and follow their fate. And he compared these to retroviruses that just express GFP. And what he did, and I'm just summarizing again, is he would give CNO just in the first week or the second week. He, he tried to find different windows where activation of these adult-born granule cells really early might promote uh, mismigration or um, aberrant maturation. And essentially what he found is that if you activated the cells with CNO just in that first week after retrovirus infection or the second week, uh, six weeks later, when he did the histology, he would see ectopic granule cells that were, you know, retrovirally labeled, and and he wouldn't find them any at, at sort of when the cells were already fully mature. So this suggests that really, when cells are very immature, when they're really early, that this early activity can promote ectopic migration. And so then we looked to see, we asked if that ectopic migration when you activated early was sufficient to disrupt the network and maybe promote epilepsy. So again, the answer is yes. So again, cells that were activated early in just the first and the second week, only those animals experienced these spontaneous convulsive seizures. None of the other animals did. So, so although the numbers of seizures were quite low compared to like the pilocarpine model, for example, but this allowed us to conclude that at least early activation of these adult-born granule cells was sufficient to generate some spontaneous seizures. So now we go to the pilocarpine model where, you know, these animals will experience like two to three spontaneous seizures a day. And then we asked if we um, conversely silenced these cells with HM4DI, also early, just in the first couple of weeks, if that was sufficient to reduce this ectopic migration and reduce some of these abnormal, abnormal, you know, morphological changes and seizures. And so again, the answer is yes. So the animals that have silencing in the first two weeks, there, there was a lot more of, uh, of these cells that show these sort of more apical projected dendrites as opposed to these cells normally in the pilocarpine model, they're quite misoriented. And there were also fewer cells that were ectopic compared to the control. And these uh, animals also had fewer spontaneous seizures. In fact, they didn't completely go away, but this was very similar to when we ablated the cells. 
So it suggests that we don't really have to remove the cells to study this phenomena. We could we could simply use um, retroviruses and um, like an, you know activating dread or a silencing dread to manipulate or perturb these adult-born granule cells early in their development to ask what is happening and how do they contribute to these uh, to these disrupted networks and the epilepsy. Okay, so then again, because this is published, I'm just summarizing how we then are getting from this phenomena to at least maybe the molecular mechanism. So what we noticed is that when we, when we, what, what exactly did we do when we used dreads? And so we, we know that these cells are still very immature. They're not really firing these mature action potentials. And when we used a calcium, a genetically encoded calcium indicator, G-CAMP, also expressed in a retrovirus, and if you just do it like a slice preparation, you can see that these, the, what we found is that in the pilocarpine treated animals, there was already elevated calcium in these two week old adult born granule cells, and that this elevated calcium could be suppressed with the dread when we treated with CNO. And so we hypothesized that maybe this early calcium activity, similar to other developing neurons, maybe altering gene expression programs, that might be promoting migration, changes in migration and maturation. And so what we wanted to do is use this approach as a tool to identify and determine the role of these putative calcium activity mediated genes. And so Perul, a, a very talented postdoc in the lab, what she did was she replicated uh, the, the pilocarpine model and she used the HM4DI dread. And she treated those animals with two weeks with CNO to silence the, these adult-born granule cells after pilocarpine treatment. And then she used the fact that there's GFP expression to sort those cells and do bulk RNA sequencing. And so when you compare, there were three groups of animals. There were animals that were just treated with sham. There was animals also treated with pilocarpine. So if you just looked at the gene expression changes between sham and pilo, there's about 387 gene expression differences. So genes would go up, genes would go down. Then now if you compare the pilo-treated group with this group that were silenced, there's only about 33 genes that were different. And then when you intersect those, only five that were in common. Um, a little bit surprising, but maybe not so surprising because our cutoffs were very stringent. So one of those genes is this uh, tissue inhibitor of matrix metalloprotease 3. So this TIMP3 gene, which is, I, I think, very well established, particularly in the, in the cancer biology field. So TIMP3 is downregulated when, uh, when you induce uh, status epilepticus and in those two-week-old adult-born granule cells. And then interestingly, when you silence those cells, now TIMP3 is not down not down regulated okay so we were very interested in tim3 so as i alluded to so tim3 so the tim family of genes just to remind everyone there's four family members and tim3 as as well as the other TIMPs, they endogenously inhibit these matrix metalloproteases. So here in this schematic, the matrix metalloproteases are like these Pac-Man molecules, okay, in orange. And what they typically do is they're uh, outside the in the extracellular ma matrix, and they are binding and degrading the ECM. And the TIMPs, in fact, TIMP3 is the only one that binds firmly to the ECM after it's secreted. And what it will do is it will inhibit these little Pac-Man, these matrix metalloproteases. And so, so, so if the cell is using the MMPs to degrade the matrix, that could cause and promote you know, invasion and, and migration of the cells, which is, of course, particularly important if, it's, if you're a cancer cell, and also important particularly if you're a, maybe a migrating neuron. And so sure enough, there are roles for TIMP3 in neuronal survival and neural outgrowth. But not a lot has been looked at, particularly in adult-born granule cells and in the context of epilepsy. 
So in order to look at this, uh, Gopu noticed that there is a small molecule drug. It's actually an LXR agonist, T09. We, we shorten it because it's, it's this long name. And at least in cancer cells and also in Alzheimer's disease mice, this small molecule, T09, has been shown to have um, specificity to downregulate TIMP3 at the transcription level so that there's reduced mRNA and then also protein. So we thought this might be a, a relatively uh, straightforward way to test what the effect of downregulating TIMP3 is in a, in a control animal that has not experienced pilocarpine. And so that's what exactly what Gopu did here. He took wild type C57 black six mice. He, of course, he gave some BRDU treatment because he wanted to um, follow the fate of the, so these proliferating uh, neural progenitors. And then we we basically treated the animals uh, with T09 to downregulate TIM3 and compared to vehicle treatment. And then we did some histology at, at about two weeks, right? So two weeks is when we noticed that some of those cells might have aberrant changes in the in the epilepsy model and so what gopu found is i'm showing you uh, this, uh, representative images of the dentate gyrus. The green is a label for double cortin, which is a marker for immature neurons. And then BRDU is shown in red. And, and what he noticed is that in the T09 treated animals, is these are animals that don't have pilocarpine. So these animals don't have sort of these overt, you know, behavioral seizures. But at least histologically, it looks like there is an increase in the percentage of these BRDU labeled immature neurons, suggesting that there's an increased uh, maybe neurogenesis, possibly, we have to confirm that, but at least some of these you know, newly dividing immature neurons are also found in the hilus, so suggesting that it's like looking like they're maybe migrating ectopically. So we have to do a lot more ex experiments to see if we're really down-regulating TIMP3, if this is really changing the extracellular matrix. Um, all of that is ongoing. We, Gopu also noticed that compared to the vehicle treated, where these, these newborn neurons have this nice perpendicular uh, dendrite, a, this apical dendrite, some of the newborn double cortin expressing cells in the T09 treated group show, uh, so similar to the what you find about these cells in the pilocarpine model, that they would be quite misoriented. Their, their dendrites would uh, be not necessarily perpendicular to the, to the axis of the subgranular zone, and also even some cells had more than one primary dendrite or multiple primary dendrites. So we tried to um, quantify the, this alteration in the angle as a proxy for maybe aberrant dendritic uh, morphology. And then the question is, do those animals also have any spontaneous seizure? So we, we did electro, uh, we basically did video EEG recording um, you know, after this T09 treatment, and uh, and what we notice is, first of all, the animals do not seem to have uh, behavioral seizures like in the pilocarpine model. But we notice that here, the, this is sort of flipped. So the upper row is the T09, and the lower row is an example trace of vehicle. And in those T09 treated animals, there seem to be more of this high freq high gamma activity. So typically gamma is low, but in these animals, there was gamma activity that was greater than 100 hertz, um, maybe reminiscent of non-convulsive seizures. And we're still looking into this to see if this is something that is, um, this is an abnormal and inconsistent feature. But at least in the preliminary data, this is what we're seeing. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up this part of the talk, just kind of going back using our tool to understand what is really mechanistically different and distinct about those specific adult-born granule cells, you know, during this latent epileptogenic period, we think that we've identified at least one gene. There probably is many other ones, but at least this one's TIM3 is downregulated in these two-week-old granule cells, possibly through this activity-mediated um, alteration, and that by blocking TIM3 in control animals, we're, we're kind of mimicking maybe what is happening you know, with the pilocarpine model, where we see these increased ectopic granule cells, migration, these dendritic malformations, and at least some of these non-convulsive seizure-like activity. 
And so then going forward, you know, to this this drug is is being used in cancer cells and uh, in in some tumor um, situations. So maybe this drug could also be something that could. Uh, well, obviously, we don't want to promote you know abnormal changes normally, but maybe we could find ways another way to reverse this. So that's kind of where we're going with it. Okay. And there is, there's also this question always of what is unique, even among these aberrant adult-born granule cells, what's really just promoting the ones that are ectopic? And that is difficult for us to know at this point because we sorted all the cells. Some of them are ectopic and some of them are not ectopic or normatopic. So we are now uh, doing, uh, we're planning to do spatial transcriptomics so that we could still kind of further go in and see what the differences are because we do want to try to preserve as much of these sort of normal or beneficial newborn neurons and just target these abnormal ones. All right, so if there's um, no questions at this point, I think I'm going to transition to the next part of my talk, and that's um, really to get at these genetic epilepsies. And so I, you know, really, I think after leaving my postdoc and starting my own lab uh, at UT Southwestern and really kind of uh, really wanting to get more, uh, having more of an impact on, on patients being at a medical school. Then uh, we teamed up with a child neurologist, a pediatric epileptologist, and uh, one of the patients that he had that had an intractable epilepsy has a mutation in the gene ARX. So among all of, there's, there's probably now more than 120 genes that um, have been linked to childhood epilepsy, these developmental epilepsies. And if you wanna know why we started working on ARX, it was simply because uh, our uh, collaborator has a, had a patient that was um, affected by this gene, and so that's where we started. And um, the the ARX is uh, is a transcription factor. So in a, in so it, the homeobe domain binds and interacts and regulates both positively and negatively many other genes, but. Um, but one of the, um, in fact, the mutation that is linked to epilepsy is a polyalanine expansion. It's not in the DNA binding domain. So it's in this polyalanine track two. There's four polyalanine tracks that are highlighted in blue. And the mutations in the first and second one are more commonly associated with epilepsy, interestingly, and intellectual disability. And among and, and in terms of polyalanine expansion, they are they are actually found in quite a, a nine different genes. Eight of them are transcription factors, and many of them are common to developmental disorders. So there might be something very interesting about just what do polyalanines do? What does expansion do? And they never get more than twenty alanines. Interestingly. Okay, so. So because there's, of course, these large differences between mouse and human brain, and, uh, and, and including this you know, radial glials and this outer radial glia population that maybe contribute to this more expanded cortex, and also because of the way interneurons maybe migrate. So in the mouse, they migrate from the MGE and the LGE into the cortex. The human, they, all, they migrate from the ganglionic eminence, but there's also maybe a local source of inhibitory interneurons. So because of these differences, we were very excited um, to basically take advantage of these human IPS-derived uh, models and these brain organoids. So we uh, were able to fortunately be able to team up with, um, I think, sort of uh, really prominent researchers who've been working on ARX and polyalanine expansions for quite a number of years. So Jeff Golden, um, he was at the Brigham at the time, and now he's moved to Cedar sinai We collaborate extensively for this project, and also Eric Marsh, who's at um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia at UPenn. Okay, so what we've done is we've recruited patients with ARX specifically focusing on uh, polyalanine expansion. So we have our, this study I'm gonna tell you is, is expansion in track two, but there's also patients that are coming um, that have expansion track one. We make these organoid models to recapitulate both the excitatory and the inhibitory neurons, and, uh, and then with the idea that we're going to try to recapitulate that circuit. And the ultimate goal is to use these models for like personalized drug screening, because again, in these particular patients, they're uh, refractory to all of the current available anti-seizure drugs. Okay, so in this current study, we have three control uh, 
lines, IPS lines. Uh, the, the gene ARX is on the X chromosomes, so all of the patients that have epilepsy or intellectual disability are male. And um, so we our control healthy uh, patients are also male. And, um, and again, I mentioned that they have expansion in TRAC2. So normally, there's 12 alanines. So our, all of our patients, we, we focused on ones having eight, although there are some that have more than eight or fewer than eight. But we're just trying to control for this number, just in case it matters. OK, so then Vanessa, very talented postdoc, and Parole, again, they teamed up to work on this. And they made, they, uh, we tested various protocols, but we decided to um, sort of use um, Sergio Pasca's lab's protocol where we uh, and modified it slightly. And so we're making, uh, many of you are familiar with this, but we're making cortical and we're making ganglionic eminence organoids using a variety of growth factors um, that kind of simulate both the dorsal and the ventral patterning. And so this, because um, the Pasca lab has published this protocol, our, our, our aim was to just um, sort of um, pheno copy what, what their protocol is. And then we use our single cell RNA sequencing and compare it to their published protocol just to, uh, make, to verify that we um, have the cortical organoids that express the different cortical cell types, like PAX6 and CTIP2 and SATB2. And also, um, and we tested two different time points, one month and four months, sort of as a proxy of like an early stage cortex and a, a more intermediate stage cortex. And then similarly with the ganglionic eminence organoids, we do the same thing. So we do immunohistochemistry to, for NKX 2.1, a GABAergic progenitor marker, also marker like GABA, and a marker CXCR4, which is a marker expressed in migrating interneurons. And we also follow that up with single cell RNA sequencing to confirm the ganglionic eminence cell types. OK, so I think confident that we have the organoid protocol and the organoids in hand, we go ahead and compare this to our ARX and our control patients. So all of this data is um, from the three, all, from all three cell lines that we have in each, in each group. And we're looking at least of multiple clones per line. And the single cell RNA sequencing is taking data from four pooled organoids. So the, I'm summarizing a lot of data because, be, because we didn't really know what to expect. And we certainly didn't necessarily expect expect changes in cortical because the, the ARX um, patients, uh, the, there have been mouse models made uh, with particularly with these expansion mutations. And most of the phenotypes suggest an interneuron phenotype. But we thought we should also look at cortical. OK, so then the cortical ones, the, one of the most prominent changes is an increase of these radial glia cells. So you can see there's not much difference with the other cell types, but with the radial glia cells, as defined by a variety of genes, this seems to be more or more prevalent in the, in the one-month cortical in the, from the ARX patients. And so their one marker of, that defines this, this cluster, this radial glial cells, is HES5. There's many other radial glia genes, and I can show you all of them. But just for simplicity, I'm showing you one representative marker. HES5, we did RNA scope because the antibody didn't work really great in our hands. But we do see an increased expression of HES, HES5 as a um, representative of this increased radial glia cell of, from the ARX patients. So then this is early. So what happens uh, a little bit later, so in four months? So in four months, one of the most prominent changes we see, so now at this point, the change in rate, the, there's really no difference in radial glia cells by a variety of different markers. But in the outer radial glia cell, like with the marker FAM107, this appeared to be decreased now. So then we thought maybe a decrease, maybe an early increase in radial glia leads to maybe a depletion of those progenitor cells. That might affect cortical neuron differentiation. So we looked at CTIP2 as a marker and SATB2 at four, four months. And we saw a decrease in CTIP2 and SATB2. Um, the SATB2 was, uh, there was a, 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 an effect, but it wasn't statistically significant. So it's possible, again, we're only at four months. And maybe with further time in, in culture, we might see a more um, prominent difference. OK, so just to summarize this part, so it seems like at least in the one month this what we call an early stage, there's already an increased radial glia cells. So maybe they're coming out of the gate earlier for some reason when they have this polyalanine expansion. And then four months, at four months, slightly later stage, now you have a, 
decrease in this outer radial glia cell population and followed by a decrease in cortical neurons. So the question is, are they just taking, is it just a premature differentiation and then eventually at longer time points they catch up? We don't really know. And uh, do and the other question is, do we see an evidence of an increase or premature differentiation? So we uh, by gene expression, we do see some neuronal markers like NeuroD uh, and DL, DLK1 uh, upregulated at this one month time point. But uh, we're again, we're confirming some of that. All right, so that's what I just said. Premature differentiation, depletion of progenitor pool, less cortical neurons. That's what the cortical. What about the ganglionic eminence? So with that, uh, there's looks like at the there wasn't really that much at one month to be honest. So I'm not showing you any of that data because most of it was not no difference. But at four months, we notice uh, less of this immature neuron marker TUJ1. So we're looking to see if there's also less uh, mature neuronal markers. And uh, we because we know GABA is is mo most of these cells are inhibitory. Um, either GABAergic progenitors or um, early differentiating neurons, we looked at GABA, and there was also a slight reduction of GABA. So as a marker of interneurons, we looked at CXCR4, because again, this is only four months, so you may be wondering, what about these like really mature interneuron markers? So I will say that at four months, we don't really detect a lot of those cell types. Maybe we detect cal calretinin, uh, but at least CXCR4, we do detect, and uh, surprisingly, it's elevated in the, from the ARX patient organoids, which was opposite to what we expected and also opposite to what is observed in some of the mouse models. Okay, so then with this in hand, since we thought there is um, a, a, a phenotype in the cortex, there's less cortical neurons, but there also is um, an increase in this migrating interneuron in the ganglionic eminence, how, when you put this together, what, do, what happens? And so we try to do that, right? So that's where we can fuse the cortical organoid uh, with the ganglionic eminence, and we can do this where they are controls versus the ARX patients. So following um, the methods that have been published by others, we use uh, synapsin, which is expressing M-cherry to label the cortical side, and the DLX to label the interneurons on the ganglionic eminence side. So after fusion, we also can confirm that the, the DLX GFP cells can you know, migrate over into the ganglion, uh, from the ganglionic eminence into the cortical side. Okay, so then Vanessa looked at these individual DLX GFP labeled cells, and what she observes between control on the upper panel and the ARX on the lower panel is that there's an increase in the distance of their migration as well as the speed of their migration. So again, really surprising to us, but maybe consistent with this elevation of the CXCR4 expression, which is, you know, of course, very important in cell migration. So the question is, is this cell autonomous? So if we plot these, uh, these ARX, ARX fusions in yellow, you can see that their distance migration is uh, elevated compared to control-control fusions. So then if, to ask if this is cell autonomous, we fuse ganglionic eminence that are from the ARX patients to control cortical organoids uh, here on here label and then here on this um, schematic and to and then plot it over here this is labeled in red and so you can see that the distance uh, behave the, there is also this increased migration of, of, of ARX ganglionic eminence fused to control cortical organoids suggesting that 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 ex increase in the speed is autonomous to the ARX um, genotype and then the, the final uh, uh, combination is where you have control ganglionic eminence, you know, fused to ARX cortical, so, and then labeled here in blue, those distance is very similar to the control-control fusion, suggesting that at least this increased neuronal migration is not, uh, not, not there's not really a contribution from the ARX uh, mutant cortex. Okay, so to summarize that part, 
Here, we think for the ganglionic eminence, both the individual ones and also the fusions, there is an effect on GABAergic differentiation. There is an increase in interneuron migration, as suggested by the fusion experiments, and also this appears autonomous to the ARX mutation. And there is correlated uh, increased CXCR4 expression. So the, the, the question is, does CR, CXCR4 play a role. So if we block CXCR4 in these mutant organoids, can we, um, can we prevent this? Can we rescue this? Similarly, if we were to um, alter CXCR4 in control organoids, can we recapitulate this phenotype? Or is there other mechanisms involved? Okay, so then at the very end, I want to now transition to what is sort of the functional consequences of this. You know, this is kind of getting back to our ultimate vision is that we would be able to model these um, organoids coming from patients and have a personalized model in order to screen or discover new um, anti-seizure, potential anti-epileptic compounds. These patients, are, of course, are refractory to the current available ones. The other thing is they now have epilepsy, and they also have a host of other developmental disabilities. So is, it, is, it, is there still a window of time where we can intervene? And that's the, that's the ultimate question. And so we, um, we wanted to find a functional readout of this. So Zane Librand at first was taking advantage of these uh, multi-well, multi-electrode array um, to, to do extracellular, extracellular recording of these organoids. And, um, and initially, we were very inspired and got help from the Muotri lab for some of these protocols. So then that, that kind of went forward, but to be honest, we weren't that satisfied with the multi-well, multi-well, multi multi-electrode arrays, because each of the wells only have like three electrodes or four electrodes, and we had a very difficult time getting the organoids to attach. So then um, very recently, Sarah Mishradegi joined the lab. She um, is bringing a lot of kind of innovative ideas. Um, I'm going to show you some very preliminary data. It's, it's very recent, and we only have like one, one uh, control and one or, uh, ARX. So just please take this data with a grain of salt. Um, we use this um, more the 60 electrode chip. And um, still, it's 2D, so you have to put the organoid. But she's figured out ways to get the organoids to attach better. So I'll, sh I'll show you that data. And then she also has um, a 3D chip that we don't have data yet. But I really think that this is going to help, because everything what we're seeing is, of course, contact uh, with the organoid on these electrodes is, re is really important. OK, so these are fused organoids, right? They have the cortical, and they have the ganglionic eminence. Um, you can still kind of see maybe that, that part where the organoid fused. Sometimes you kind of see that, like, that little indentation. But at this point, we haven't reconstructed to see which side is the cortical side and which side is the ganglionic eminence. So we do have the GFP and the M-cherry there to map this, and we're doing that now. And so these were fused at 60 days in vitro. They, these organoids have been growing and as a fused for about a year. And because Sarah just recently joined the lab as a graduate student, she was really excited to test this out. So again, it's like N of 1. And this is the core control. And this is an ARX. So she was blinded to which was which. Okay, And Vanessa was growing the organoids. So these are the 60 electrodes. And I'm showing you. Uh, oh, the other thing I want to mention is that these are 20 minute long recordings. So what Zane was doing before with the multi-well system was like a five minute recording, very or three minute, very short. But with these, she's able to basically get the these these 60 electro chips um, in a in a a thing where it's covered or something. I don't I don't know what she calls them, but they they are covered and they have sort of this like internal humidified environment and then she can put the whole she does the, the entire recording in the incubator. So we also notice that the temperature is really important especially when you're doing these longer, you know, 20 minute even over an hour sort of what she calls a chronic recording. So they're done in the, inside the incubator. Um, and the other thing is she's coding the MEA with a poly-L ornithine and laminin. 
And she's uh, basically um, really optimizing the amount of media in there so the organoids attach better. There's stronger attachment. Okay, so so down here is all 20 minutes, just so you can see all of the different spiking activities, you know, from zero to 20. And that's expanded for just one of these electrodes. And hopefully you can see, of course, you can see all 60, and, but it's too tiny to see all of the spiking behavior. Okay, so this is just your control at baseline. And so the first question Sarah had was in order to verify whether these organoids contain matured networks, she's going to use apply certain drugs, very standard. So she used glutamate, and she sees uh, to, to ask if that alters this spiking activity. Activity. And she also wanted me to point out to all of you is that she's um, filtering the data. So this is action potential activity that we're seeing here. Okay. So then again, 10 micromolars of glutamate was added to the media. And then she starts the recording after five minutes. And maybe you can see there is an elevation of activity. Um, okay. And then now she, after 20 minutes, she adds 10 micromolars of GABA to the media and again starts the recording after five minutes and hopefully you can see most of that activity um, was reduced or went away. And as you know, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So the expectation is that if the network is matured, this is uh, we would see this outcome as less activity. And then finally, she adds picrotoxin, which is a GABA-A receptor ag uh, antagonist. So 50 micromolars of picrotoxin was added to the media, and then recording was started after five minutes. And, it, and then what, what hopefully you can see is it seems like the activity is, is elevated again, okay? And even more so, because you're blocking all GABA-A uh, receptor. Okay, so even if the GABA neurotransmitter is still at the synapse, uh, it should not have an inhibitory effect with picrotoxin. So now something very different happens with the ARX, but again, take it with a grain of salt. You know, Sarah was blinded to which was which, but we only have you know an N of one. So with the ARX fused organoids, there's a lot more activity at baseline. Um, again, this is a 20 minute long recording inside the incubator. And um, this is, uh, again, you know, spikes that are frequently more than 400 hertz, which is corresponding to action potentials. So then with glutamate, it, it doesn't seem to be a huge difference because I think at baseline there was already a lot of activity. With GABA, interestingly, we don't block this activity, suggesting that maybe there is a lack of a GABA response. And when you add picrotoxin, it just seems like there's everything is high or <laughs> to me. Um, I, I apologize, I'm not really an like, electrophysiologist, but Sarah was very surprised by this. Okay, so that's what we have so far. And I wanted to show you today so that, um, you know, in our discussions we can have more, um, we would like to have feedback about this. This is unpublished. And um, so what are some of the limitations of this? So we think, you know, obviously these are, these are organoids and um, this could be a very early stage of the disease. These are still very immature and we were just talking about strategies to, to mature them so that we don't necessarily have to, you know, grow these for over a year or even longer. That would make experiments a lot easier. And also we would like to have more complexity, you know, maybe connecting different regions of the brain. Um, and, uh, and very recently we were uh, funded by the Brain Initiative by, um, as part of this larger group in collaboration with the Southwest National Primate Research Center to um, try to make a transgenic ARX marmoset. Um, the marmosets, as some of you may or may not know, are um, they, of course, they're non-human primates, but they have, um, they give rise to um, bur uh, litters, I don't know if they're called litters, but basically multiple births, including twins, and uh, they do have um, a lot of uh, great social behaviors that can be um, very amenable to modeling, particularly for epilepsy, and um, and we are also making marmoset organoids to compare to fetal marmoset brain tissue with the ultimate goal of having all of these models come back and try to help the patient. 
And so with that, um, I wanted to acknowledge the, all of the various cores that uh, really are instrumental for this work, like the stem cell core, our uh, genomics core, and the various sequencing cores for this work. Uh, for the first part of the um, study, I want to acknowledge uh, Dran Song and Alejandro Schinder for help with the dreads. We also have um, conditional dread mice that we could um, do some of these follow-up studies. And also um, Cheryl Shulbridge for also helping us recruit ARX patients. Um, I want to acknowledge the patients and their families and also my funding support. And uh, with that, I just want to thank everyone in the lab, but I did make sure I acknowledge all of the different um, people who directly did the work and our collaborators along the way. So I hopefully I did leave some time for questions, and um, I'd be delighted to uh, hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. So I was really intrigued by the figure you showed where you added GABA. Mm -hmm. and there was no really response to the organoids, and it made me think back to what you had said about the uh, medication refractory, medica uh, these patients being refractory to medications. Um, and is a in many of these drugs that we give mm -hmm. epilepsy patients, they, there's a variety of mechanisms, but some of them act at the GABA receptor. And so I wonder if this explains some of their refractory behavior, and B, would this be a good model to try to screen some of these anti-epileptic medications to see which current ones mm -hmm. might work for these individual patients, and we thought about doing that. Yeah, I mean, that that's actually, that's exactly right. And that is the whole reason why a few years ago we set out to do this is because we really lack these patient-specific patient models. As you know, we have, we have the mouse models, but they haven't always necessarily panned out. And... Um, and also, you know, I kind of went fast, but the patients are all, they have pho different phenotypes, even with the same eight polyalanine expansion. So the, you know, the, the, um, when they develop epilepsy, the other comorbidities are all extremely different on an individualized level. So, um, I, so I think, first of all, we definitely need to replicate this for absolutely. But um, I do think that there are more, um, there's a lot more interest with rare disease research, and even a lot of foundations are really getting back behind um, to fund and support rare diseases. So maybe N of one types of experiments are more feasible now. Yeah, that's certainly where we had it. And if I can follow up and ask, can I ask you to speculate how you think that the ARX mutation with the the enhanced migration that you're seeing might be leading to this enhanced excited, excitability of these uh, organoids, and then presumably in the patient's brains as well. Yes, yeah, so if I were to expand, or at least speculate, the, the ARX, I, so we do observe GABAergic, there, we do observe GABA expression, and there are clearly, when you do the single cell RNA seq, there are GABAergic interneurons. They're not, they're, 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 they, they are there. They might be reduced in numbers, but it's, it's not that they're not there. So, and the, but as you can see, we see this slightly, you know, faster migration. So it's possible they're not finding their synaptic targets. So is that because the cortical neurons are reduced, or if there's something else? We don't really know, but I think my my speculation would be that they're they're continuing to migrate because something about them autonomously is they're not you know making their connections. I see. So maybe they're not finding the appropriate connections, so they're still searching, and that's why they're either they're still searching or they're lost. Or <laughs> I like it. And let's uh, let's thank Jenny for her wonderful talk today. Thank you.